we are interested in talking about all things that are connected to faith, but we don't mean that in a way that limits to any singular definitions of what faith means, I think. Or in non-dogmatic ways. Yeah. And we're interested in talking about bodies, but not in ways that are limited to cells right. and constructions about like haircuts. Right. Unless haircuts are your things, then good for you. No, I have some dysphoria when it comes to hair. Okay. So we don't have to spend time on that. No, we don't have to talk about it. I just meant that. Yes. Like if you like your hair, hooray. Yeah. When we think about bodies, I think there is this idea to think about bones and skin and flesh and, and marrow, but my sense of the way that you speak about it in your writing and the ways that I think about it in terms of like being a reverend doctor, whatever the heck that means, is that it also involves communities of people, bodies of people, maybe bodies of what, maybe geographies, like bodies of water, maybe it means um bodies of work like words strung together in awesome books which i see on the back table i think it means ways that we encounter each other in different spaces and time like the body we are as these these people gathered in this room might be different than who we think we are next week or who we think we are next month or maybe what words we use to describe ourselves next month. Um, and I think this idea of becoming starts with the idea that we are not a static thing that necessarily transitions, but that we are people in the process of a thing that is a goal in the out there. And and so I would posit having, having sort of regurgitated what you've written about and lived experience, my experience of being in this beautiful city and the ways that it's shifted in terms of economy and gentrification and poverty and, and class and culture is that the becoming is about this collective yearning or hope into the future that we know exists because we have faith mm -hmm. and won't exist if we don't make it. Mm -hmm. And so the becoming is, is this thing we are compelled to do. And sometimes the world tries to stop us from doing, but we do the work anyway, whether we get credit or not. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is? Well, I'm, I'm deeply inspired by, um, in particular, the Zapatistas who imagined the possibility of another possible world. And so that got me thinking about how do we create conditions for ethical futures? I, I think we spend a lot of time uh, investing in electoral politics and now we're encouraging all BIPOC individuals to run for office, which I wonder why we are doing that. Because I think as soon as anyone gets into some sort of institutional office like the government, they're expected to acquiesce. And so marginalized folks become complicit in the very thing that they're trying to compost. And so I, I just sort of was very concerned about this. And as a theologian and ethicist, I began to think about, um, think about and think through bodies. So not just our individual body and not just our interpersonal bodies, but our cultural body or our democratic body. I feel like we are um, wounded in very real ways, white bodied folks, bodies of culture, you know, we are, we are each wounded. And so how do we suture those wounds? And how do we have relationships to create conditions for an ethical future? And I, and I tried to write that in body becoming and I, you know, don't know if I succeeded, but 
I, I feel sort of um, deeply, deeply concerned with just the future of our society. Religion has become a tool of supremacy culture. Um, we saw the ways in which um, Christian supremacy became a weapon against against Muslim people after 9-11 that continued to grow. So I, I, I find myself just deeply concerned with the state of our world globally, but certainly in, in this country. And how do we become a body together to create an ethical future? That's sort of where I am. As I think about sort of queer history, in in on the globe let alone in san francisco there's always been several streams of queer history and this is really limiting all the different types of forces and but i think it's fun to think about this idea that there's the normals those who want the same rights and hairstyles as everyone else in their community right little boxes on a hillside little boxes full of ticky tacky we want to we want the house like our neighbors we want the job like our name we want to like have a life that's beyond having to name our identities and to just be seen as the normals right and then there's the queers uh which were the hair fairies or were the the lesbian avengers or whatever in iteration of like lavender menace that people were in the world and it was people intentionally trying to fuck with the world or bedazzle it right so to either make it prettier or um to drag it to dramatize the ways in which the normals are a play that isn't real right and so to live this more fun life a more fabulous a more proud a more vibrant and on the one hand the queers had permission to like not be normal and to screw it all up but when you like then worked in a space sometimes the queers had the pressure of like being a superhero beyond because if you were the first in a job you either had to be perfect at it or no one else could be in that job right and some some folk like sylvester or um, Jose Saria, people who just gave no fucks, right? Were able to sort of live this life that seemed like it was above because they were gonna take the fabulous and make it bigger, like the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. We're gonna make the fabulous bigger because the grief was so big. If you didn't make the fabulous bigger, we would just cry mm -hmm. and the grief would consume us. And so there have been always queers that buoy us above because they live bigger and more fabulous. But the ache of that is, is it's not sustainable to live that way forever, right? You have to um, retreat and, you know, be men with beards who drum in the woods and like right. have places of separation, like the Castro, where you can be like, ugh, I'm just with the gays now and it's gonna be fine, right? Like we needed sanctuaries. And then every time I think in history, we felt like we had a sanctuary, a thing would happen where that place would not be safe. And then we'd be like, oh crap, they set our bar on fire or they threw firebombs at the MCC church, right? Like, and so part of this rhythm of queer history and queer life is that you can, you can strive your whole life with the goal of equal, or you can strive your whole life with the goal of buoying the hope for others, but there is this equal and opposite sadness mm -hmm. that you can't be perfect in that and you can't live it enough to make every person not choose to not take their own life, right? And so there is this way that we have had moments of queer community where we've been able to grieve. Like the AIDS quilt is a good example of when we were like, okay, we found a way to grieve. Um, but I don't think we've always found that. Like we haven't found ways to mourn meth 
and we haven't found ways to mourn that 40% of both the adults and young people in San Francisco who are homeless are queer. Right. We haven't found ways to mourn the 330 anti-LGBTQ laws that are popping up around the country. We haven't found ways to mourn the ways we have to like take off our bedazzling and feel safe at the post office, right? So we haven't figured out ways to mourn the honesty that we're not superheroes, but we've, we've had to live in the world as them in order to just get as far as we've come. And so I, I feel like we simultaneously have this permission to fuck up, but also no ability to fuck up that I think is really hard for queer community to hold in this march, path, whatever it is of becoming that we're doing. I think about myself as a rear guard theologian, and I borrow that term from my teacher, Dr. Nancy Bedford. And the idea of a rear guard th theologian is, um, it's not someone who casts visions. It's not a, a, an attempt to be a prophet, but it's someone who comes alongside and and sort of supports from the behind and kind of speaks into things. And I think that there has been a real danger with queer folks, trans folks being tokenized as the one to cast the vision. And, and we have certainly, I think, gotten farther away from community when we have that expectation for one person to cast a vision. And we sort of buy into the, the what I call the fourth world war, which is neoliberalism. And so how do we simultaneously sort of confront that, which is very real, the neoliberalism, the hyper-individuality, the logic of whiteness, and also create conditions for community. Because I think it's in that kind of relationality, the sort of communal relationality that we see each other and that we find connection and that we become a better body individually, interpersonally, and collectively. Well, and we're also, um, I won't speak for you, but I sit here as an autistic person for whom like the way my body functions in the world is different than what I'm told mm -hmm. is how bodies function for other people in the world. And statistically, there seems to be some sort of correlation between trans folk maybe and autism. What it is, I don't know. Um, if you got a study on trans people, I probably won't believe it. So even if we did know what it meant, we wouldn't know what it meant. Um, but what I experience in, in my body as an autistic person is that it, it feels like the whole world has a rule book that they won't share. And you navigate the world doing the best you can, sort of thinking the world should be done ethically and then you should just follow those ethics that you have, just follow them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, tripping over social norms that you're told means that you didn't follow the rules. And so it, also for me means that like the world is too bright and too loud and too fast. And there are ways in which sensations from outside my body feel like pain that's physical, like high pitched noises feel like physical pain in my body. Um, I have an eight and a nine year old, so pray for me all. Um, so it's, it's what I don't, um, have an experience of in that reality is a body that feels comfortable or not in pain or not in danger, which is a strange way to be a body in the world in a culture that sells feeling safe as the best car to get, as the best house to have, as the best neighborhood to be a part of, as the best community to be a part. Like we will keep you safe through the ways we work. Like 
insurance will make your house not burn down. That's not true, y'all. But that's the set, like, right? Mayhem will happen unless you get this thing, right? So we live in a culture that's about feeling like our being an adult is being organized enough to like have fewer consequences or our being responsible is about like having enough foresight that we do not have problems like these or whatever that is. And as, an, as, as someone who's autistic, I feel like I have the gift of not having to pretend I wanna talk to people at parties if I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I usually do wanna talk to people because I genuinely care about people, but as an introvert, not always. But you know what I mean? Like, so I feel like there are ways in which imagine a world where like you could be normal. It feels like that was never like if the two choices of being queer in the world is you can be normal or you could be queer. Being autistic meant I only had one lane. Mm -hmm. Because being autistic was its own a different slant on being queer, but being disabled or as I identify a crip theologian being someone for whom my, one of my moral ethical stances is that people not only get to identif identify their own way of describing their body, but they get to tell you your, their body's limits and they need to be honored without judgment when we're having our best days, right? And so that for me is one of those pillars that I hold to of where being an autistic person matters in the conversation about what a body is, that we have to acknowledge the disabilities amongst us as well. So as another person sitting here who is also autistic, I, I can't feel my body um, unless someone is touching me or hugging me. And, you know, so even, even writing a book on bodies seemed like a, I don't know, a hazard maybe, but I tried to chart my own process of embodiment and could embodiment become a vision for democracy? I'm not in the business of casting visions, but I feel very curious if I were to be able to feel my body on the daily, could that make a difference in how I sh was in the cultural body? Um, and so I just feel very curious about this. Now, there, there are statistics, which we don't know if we are gonna believe them or not, but that one in six folks on the autism, autism spectrum are also transgender. So there does seem to be a correlation between autism spectrum disorder and transness. Um, and could, could those intersections help shed some light on how do we build community? How do we, how do we create conditions for people to connect? I mean, if I'm at a party, I am not talking to people. I'm going to sit in the corner on my phone, um, but I don't understand those social scripts. Like I understand the script of therapy and I understand the script of academia and that like I'm limited, you know? Um, so I just feel very curious about, you know, when we bring in the critique of ableism, there are many people living who, who are differently abled. And we often don't consider those folks being part of our democratic body because the democratic body, the cultural body is only reserved for those who are like hyper able, hyper visible and intelligible. I mean, for a lot of, I live in the South in Nashville and, and I am like not intelligible to people in many respects. Um, and I also don't know the social cues. And so that makes it ever more interesting. But what happens when we make visible the underside of history as, as part of our democratic body? Because for years, we have not included the underside of history as part of our democratic body, though we create policies and procedures 
that are supposed to benefit them. What happens when we expose the underside of history as part of our democratic body or part of our cultural body? How does that shape and shift our understanding of bodies? And does that create some kind of pathway to a different orientation to relationship? I, I just feel curious. Yeah, I'm curious too. I'm just making them ponder that for a little second longer. Because if I fill it with stuff, they won't. Right. Y'all look smart. You probably would have thought about it. I don't know if I know the answer like to how to fix the whole world, but I can tell you that in my uh, work as a person in the Christian church, in the interfaith world, doing chaplaincy stuff, the moments where I am dwelling with people for a long period of time, eating with them and learning their stories and rooting for them and loving them and, and being an honest, authentic relationship with them, not in a relationship where it's just like, I give you these things and then you leave. Um, but more of a like over years listening and, and being in conversations, particularly when those conversations have been uncomfortable and unexpected uh, and know that in, in my work, I've been a chaplain. I spent 12 years sitting with homeless folk on the streets uh, with such severe paranoia and schizophrenia that they were kicked out of other places to eat. Like, like they weren't even able to eat at Glide, right? And so the rule where they were eating with me was, if you're not a threat to yourself or someone else right now, you can eat. And if you are, come back when you're done. And so th those kinds of long-term conversations and then maybe like wish whiplash uh, three to four years, as a chaplain of the San Francisco Police Department for whomever wanted me to be their chaplain in whatever emergent or non-emergent situation that I found myself in, which meant I did get paid by the San Francisco Police Department to lead protests against the police department. And I would walk down the street protesting the police at any protest with like more than 40,000 people to help maintain nonviolence in a post Charlottesville world. Um, and then on the walk back at the end of the march, care for the police officers, right? And so just a weird way of dwelling with people. And the best way that I can describe it is that in San Francisco, if y'all don't know, more than 50%, almost 60% of the San Francisco Police Department is officers of color and um, a large percentage of them also are LGBTQ. So it's a different kind of diversity than you might imagine. Doesn't make policing perfect, but sometimes the bodies and the uniforms matter. Um, at least in the stories that I was hearing about what they were experiencing at the end of that protest. And so what I felt like I brought to the table as a Christian who was also queer was the years of experiences of maybe going into thumpa thumpa bars. You made me, okay. Uh, right, check it off the list. Is having in those queer communities, every time I went there to justify the fact that I would put on the uniform of a Christian because of what Christians had done to the queer community. And so I felt like the conversations I had had, um, particularly the, queer people who lived through the AIDS crisis here in San Francisco in the epicenter and were not allowed to have funerals um, or had friends who were just dumped outside of churches on Sundays because the family couldn't bear to watch them die, that those experiences they had in the midst of pandemic and epidemic that still isn't cured, y'all, to also have people of faith saying, you deserve to die because God can't be with you is a special kind of violence that is evil. But the practice that I had of trying to explain why I wore a dumb uniform and still continue to be a part of the church as a queer person made me someone who had a different kind of ears for listening to the stories of diversely embodied members of the police department who had to justify why they were wearing a uniform 
that they might be having hard conversations in their own communities about. And my listening didn't poof into existence a world where everything was fixed and better and discrimination doesn't exist and things are easy and not intersectional anymore. But uh, I would lift up that someone with a body like mine in that position to be listening changes what happens next in a way that if it was not someone with a body like mine wouldn't have been possible. And so I couldn't tangibly tell you what it meant for the first and only paid chaplain of the San Francisco Police Department after a hundred years of chaplains was trans, mm -hmm. but it meant something and something changed because of it. Can't put my finger on it, but it felt like listening mattered and it felt like my body mattered. So I don't know where to put that, but it feels like it's a part of the conversation of what's becoming in the world in our future and what it means for us to be a part of that. It makes me think about in Latin America, there is an orientation to being in the world that is thinking feeling versus here in the United States, we live life from our shoulders up and it's all about thinking. And, you know, being Pride Month um, globally, how do we, how do we get in touch with our bodies, our individual bodies, our interpersonal bodies, and our collective bodies from a thinking feeling place? And could that help steward some of these connections, maybe disparate connections that help usher in something of a renewed vision for democracy. I mean, I think that, you know, I don't know if anyone is watching the January 6th hearings. Um, I was in Chicago um, giving a talk for the YWCA and I, and I watched the first, uh, the first set of hearings, you know, and I thought to myself there, you know, there are some people who, um, there are people on all sides who are concerned for our democracy. On the, on the one hand, there are people who feel justified in the January 6th. And then on, on sort of the other end of the spectrum, there are people who are deeply concerned about January 6th. And I wonder, we talked about this at dinner, is every life grievable? And until we are able to answer that question, I'm not sure we will be able to be a democratic body that is nonviolent and that practices kind of an ethics of generativity. And I don't know what to do with that, that bind that we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here in, here in San Francisco, there's a long history of debating whose life is grievable. And I think, you know, several times I've been with gay men who point out that's the only funeral home that would care for people in the midst of the AIDS crisis in the whole Bay Area, right? And so I think we've seen moments where certain populations of people are declared, you don't have to grieve if they die. And, and over world history, you see that, like you see Christianity coming in and just slaughtering people and not even saying cake or death, just right. Jesus or dead, right? right? And all over the, the world, you see that. And, and we have this false idea, I think, part, part of this is the Reformation, y'all. And so I owe y'all an apology. I can't, I didn't do it, but I'm gonna apologize anyway, because Lutherans, as a part of their like, viva la revolution. They said it in German though, guys. But um, they, 
decided that like freedom was theirs, that they could have access to reading the Bible for the first time in a mostly illiterate place and having it be in your language. They used to go to church and people would read the Bible to them in Latin, a language they did not understand. And they couldn't go read it themselves because there weren't copies. All they could do was believe the pastors, right? right? So the, the revolution comes when they translate the Bible into German and Martin Luther goes to Wartburg Castle, not because he wants to, not because he thinks it's a great idea, not because he was an awesome academic, which he kind of was, but because they were going to kill him, right? Because revolutions eat their young. Mm -hmm. And so they, his friends kidnap him, call him Knight George. They take him to Wartburg Castle. He kind of wallows a bit because he was like, I was kind of a big deal. I really like being an academic. And they're like, shush. He decides to translate the Bible, or so the legend says. In fact, there were 12 biblical scholars, half of which were translating the Hebrew text and half of which were translating the Greek text. What Martin Luther did is he invented a new German language by making those translations into poetry. So they would say, here's a really good translation, and he would fluff them and make them generative and make them feel sacred, and he would change them because he didn't think the Bible had to be read literally. He thought it should be expanded whenever needed to include more people in who God loved. So Luther invents the phrase children of God, which everybody talks about. Children of God, it used to say sons of God. Wah, wah, right? He changes it to children of God because of course God loves women too. Just change it and put it in the translation. So Martin Luther opts for the gender neutral translation because you can always change the text as long as it includes more people. You can't change the text, he thought, to decrease the number of people that God's promises relate to. But then, so they do this beautiful thing, poetry, including more people, gender neutral language. But then they do this thing that makes it really hard for us to imagine God in all of those different embodiments that are necessary in order to even have a glimpse of the kaleidoscope of the things that faith is. They burn all the paintings, y'all. They go from monastery to monastery, church to church, and they burn the paintings that don't agree with their theology. They burn the statues because they call them idols. And you know what it left us with? Skinny white dude Jesus with Fabio hair and the six pack abs. Do you know what guys in the book of Matthew, they made fun of Jesus because he was a glutton and overweight. You seen that painting before? No, I'm sorry, they burnt it. There were probably hundreds of paintings with darker skin Jesus. They saved the ones where Jesus looked like a Roman professor. Jewish, Jewish rabbi gonna wear the clothes of the Roman people who are gonna kill him? Come on, you guys, the little sash, it's cute. They burned the paintings and burning the paintings was an attempt to get rid of the creative imagining that people have about bodies. If you were to Google right now, ancient Bible manuscript and the sacred wound of Jesus, you would get Bible paintings that were hand illustrated in handwritten Bibles before the printing press that show that Jesus had a vagina. You can choose if you wanna have that in your Google browser. Biblical, ancient biblical manuscript, Wound of Christ, vagina. It's got a clitoris and everything, you guys. I couldn't make it up if I wanted to. From the 1300s in France and everywhere, right? Such a common idea. Adam had the same scar. I have the same scars. This idea that the church was birthed out of him, right? Scandalous. If they burned all the paintings, except for the ones that only fit one idea. If that was a full spectrum of paintings and you had everything from creepy wound to vagina, like you had some stuff in between, you'd be like, oh, it makes sense. They're on this end of the spectrum. They burned the paintings. And that meant that when people tried to imagine what's God like, it narrowed this vision to a category, not because that's the oldest history or the most interesting history, they just burned all the other stuff. So what would it be like 
if, for example, for the first 130 years of Christianity, Jesus didn't have a beard. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, that's what it was like. It was 130 years after Jesus's death before they put a beard on him because beards got popular after that, right? Your imagination of what you think the body of the sacred is has been narrowed by people who have curated art for you by damaging a bunch of stuff that gives you the duty to reimagine it, to repaint it, to retell those stories that the sacred can be in a body like yours and to not apologize for it because the people who burn the painting should apologize, not the ones who bring back that fuller image of what the sacred body can be like and what our body can be like and still be considered good. Well, that's the real liberative move, right? Yeah. That our failure to imagine has kept us in situations, places, institutions that we have never should have been in. And, and yet I wonder, are we able to imagine? Because, you know, so much of oppression is the policing of imagination. Sadia Hartman said that. And I feel really curious, are we able to imagine and, and get us moving somewhere? Imagination, um, imagination is all we have on our side right now. And certainly in a month like Pride is an opportunity, right? Yeah. yeah. What is Pride if it's not sacred storytelling of people who have moved us to imagine bigger, to consider jobs that weren't allowed, to put their lives on the line, to stumble back from tragedy, to throw a shoe or a brick? Right. Salt shaker, mm -hmm. sugar shaker, mm -hmm. to dare to not only just claim jobs beyond sex work, but to claim that sex work is a job, mm -hmm. right? To unionize things that people say isn't a job, to just keep showing up, to keep um, wearing dumb uniforms. <laughs> yeah. And, um, Mark Jordan, who did a lot of work with the Catholic Church, I, don't, I couldn't ever find that he wrote this in a book anywhere, but he once said at a talk that I was at that the work of the normals or the institutions that are trying to oppress people is to keep us from doing our work, to living our calling, to being our full fabulous. And the way that they do that is to distract us, to cause us to debate instead of be, mm -hmm. and to have us try to justify ourselves rather than live the fullness of what we're called to be in this world. And so the most radical act we can do is to step away from the debate, mm -hmm. to no longer participate in the arguments about whether or not we are full of dignity and sacred and just live our call, mm -hmm. whether that's a call to be the best bear in a polyamorous San Francisco kind of um, collective, or it's to be like the most perfect um, UPS driver you could be, like whatever that space is that is your call to be in the world, whether it's to like make a ton of money so that you can like go on the best vacations or it's to serve the world and never make any money or have a pension yeah. at all, whatever it is that's your space, to stop apologizing for it, first of all. And second of all, to have the permission to stop doing the things that distract you from living that. And if that means telling your family, like, I'll come to dinner, but I won't answer these questions, or it means just being okay with the fact that 
a whole group of people are going to think you're not faithful unless you debate them. But knowing that the oppression is that people, this is maybe a, a trans example, but like if people can't believe me about why I'm going to the bathroom, why the fuck are they ever going to believe anything else I want to do? Right. You know what I mean? Like if it's a really hard, ethically complicated decision, what kind of work and backflips do I have to do to prove I made a good choice? Mm -hmm. If people can't even believe I just got to pee, mm -hmm. right? And so I can choose to spend my time proving myself or I can choose to spend my time doing the right thing with as most of my time as possible. You can't ignore all the debates or you end up on the outskirts of the, like you gotta have some people who care about the political yeah. system or you end up all in jail, right, right? Right. You gotta have some people who care about making sure you can be paid equitably and caring about union rights. And you have to have people in all the lanes who care about things to be able to have that power and that privilege to not be a part of the debate. And then when you opt into the debate, you do it to save lives, not to uh, need anyone's permission to be your full fabulousness. And every day you got to remind yourself that that's noble and just and okay. And you got to go on vacations. You got to have be supported yeah. by people who yeah. hype you up when it sucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a big believer that it does take a diversity of tactics. We just need to be very clear on what is our calling and what is our strategy to invest in. But I'm, I feel very curious about the, some thoughts in the room yeah. of who might have thoughts. But I also want to ask you one really big question that I've wanted you to come all the way here uh -oh. so that I could ask you. Okay. I could ask you in private, but I didn't. How do we not eat each other when we do this work? I feel like that is a big tendency in organizing in the political realm, certainly in faith communities. And I, you know, I've never been a fan of cancel culture. I feel like it uses the same logic of supremacy culture in trying to cancel someone. And and so I find myself really isolated in some of those thoughts because people really want to be punitive and people want people to choose a side. And I just think binary thinking, dichotomous thinking gets us into trouble. And you know, whenever there is conflict, it's not oppositional. It's not one side versus another side. You know, there's a mix of truth in, in every side. And there's more than two sides and and something can be true simultaneously in multiple sides and i think we forget that because we we want justice and somehow or another we have inherited punitive forms of justice and um which which partially comes from a place of it's a failure to be in right relationship with people. And, you know, the work that I do in the public square is just trying to model how to be human and how do we be in relationship, which, which are two very complicated things. And especially when people have a very sort of, um, staunch view on something and and I don't I just I don't think oppositional politics are going to get us free I think we need to take non-oppositional non-dualistic approaches to to things and that's very hard to do in a world that continues to want to see things as black and white even the conversation about race it makes people like myself invisible because there's no sort of discussion of anything beyond black and white, right? And some, in some parts there are, but largely the national conversation is a very black and white conversation. And so, you know, how do we hold space for the fact that this country for 30 something years had a Chinese exclusion act and um, this country 
recruited largely Mexicans to be on the side of the oppressors and to fight the Chinese and other Asian folks. You know, we, we don't know really how to hold the complexities around race or class or gender or sexuality or ability. And we have defaulted to dichotomous binary thinking and it's harming us in big ways to the point where we can't see beyond establishment politics in any of our elections in many respects. That was a much better answer than the one that was a little too lewd I was thinking of about like, just don't use teeth. Right. <laughs> Invite the room in. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, what I really love is like being in conversation with people. And, yes. and so I, I love this with Megan, but we are a body here. We're collected here. And I'm really curious what your body is speaking to you and maybe to us in these moments. Yes. Well, I mean, we contain multitudes, all of us. I, I feel curious about a hierarchy of intersections. Like, what is that? Because I think often what, what, what that tends to translate to is a hierarchy of oppressions. And then, and then we get into like oppression Olympics. And, and you know, I, I, I mean, oppression is like unprocessed trauma on a collective scale. And how, how do we respond to that and let difference be instead of trying to domesticate difference? Because I think that is a neoliberal project. And I think that is what was done in things like marriage equality, um, which is a whole other conversation. But how do we respond to oppression on a collective scale and how do we let difference be? And, and could that work help steward a different form of relationships, a different kind of humanity? Or, you know, like, you know, anthropology is sort of our understanding of what it means to be human. 
I think our anthropology is really flawed right now because we we do have a hierarchy, an anthropological hierarchy that puts white men on top, certain white men. And so how do we actually compost those hierarchies and create conditions for not just freedom as an existence, but flourishing as a real tangible outcome? I think we have to address oppression on a collective scale and let difference be. But what would you say? What if when someone says that you harmed them, you believed them? Right? And then try to live a life that believed them. Now, there's a lot of people who say that our diversity harms them. So I'm not saying you can't be you if people say it harms them. But what if you believed them that they're in pain while you remained in conversation, right? And that was not, we didn't talk people out of their pain, even if we thought their pain was biased or unjust. Like you could be racist and write about what time it is twice a day still, right? And so what if we believed people when we said, they were harmed. And what if we tried to put the emphasis in how we can learn publicly rather than the emphasis in to how we can not mess up? Because if we were honest, now imagine no one's looking. Raise your hand if you've ever left a party and felt like you said the wrong thing and you thought about it for weeks and months. And then you told the person how you were sorry about the thing you worried about. And they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. We are people who are gonna say the wrong things. We are people who are gonna encounter humans and cultures that we didn't know about before we encountered them. And so we might not know the origin of every word we ever speak and know it was rooted in something racist in the past. So like, we're not going to know every history. We're not going to know every location. We're not going to know every trauma that someone carries in their body. Does that mean we shouldn't try best practices to care for as many people as possible? No, it's not what it means. But even if you just sat and read every book, a person might talk to you and you fuck it up right? Because you're good at books. I'm speaking about myself. I pointed at you. Sorry. But like, what if we just admitted it's hard and we want to learn? What if our leaders were people who knew they needed help on stuff and could talk about it out loud without being not considered leaders? How does that change our world? For me, I personally have a rule. If someone gives me the same feedback three times, I work on it. I've had people tell me nonsense three times in a row. Does that mean I choose not to be trans because they said I should work on it? I should wear dresses more or smile more or whatever the thing. It doesn't mean you got to follow the advice of how to fix it, someone tells you. But if someone gives you the same feedback three times, I work on it because it means I'm not communicating my heart very well. If what I'm trying to communicate is that I love you and people keep saying, well, when you say that, it'd be like if your spouse says to you, yeah, but when you say it that way, you don't, love, right? It'd be like if, well, there's a phrase my mom says to me quite often and it's, you can be right or you can be married, but you don't get both, right? So if you spent your whole life trying to be right in your marriage, God bless, right? But there will be times in any relationship where you can honor, like my eight-year-old, this is, I got to tell this story. Who am I going to tell this story to you guys? My eight-year-old spent three hours lying to me yesterday, just lying to me for three hours straight. Now imagine cutest, cutest little black girl you can ever imagine, uh, eight years old, they, them, or she, her are the pronouns that they go by. Lied to me for three hours straight. Couldn't let it go. 
could have done the old school way of like, I will punish you because it's clear you are lying to me. Now, here's what happened. Lying, there were two like chicken scratches in their eyebrows. And for three hours, they said, I don't know how they got there. Something must have happened that I did not notice. Maybe I got too close to a flame when I lit the candles at church. Come on. Straight lines, symmetrically measured on both eyebrows. We did experiments with her dolls. What does it look like when the hair is on fire? What does it look like when you cut it with scissors? She committed for three hours, people, that she did not cut her eyebrows. That girl cut her eyebrows twice. Finally, at 9.30, after much evidence was presented, she confesses, well, one of my eyebrows just got cut and I don't know how. So I didn't wanna look dumb and I cut the other one. Halfway there was as far as we were gonna get you guys. As a parent, you have a choice. You can love your kid through that learning opportunity and help them grow into the future. But for some reason, when the other human beings we're encountering are adults, we think they know better. Why? I don't know. I don't know better. How many of you wake up a lot of days and you're like, apparently I'm an adult, so these are the things I'm supposed to do, right? If we loved each other, like I love my lying little eight-year-old about her eyebrows, we would let people make mistakes, say the wrong thing, learn things into the future, not have to be perfect, not expect them to know the etymology of every word they don't even know how to pronounce correctly and not have to know how to leave a party and feel like you said the right thing. But we think being an adult is a different thing. But what if when people said we hurt them, we believed them and we could publicly learn to do new things? Also, I'm racist and I'm working on it. And I hope everybody can say that and work on it, right? Because there's, I'm not gonna tell you, you are, but I am. Yeah, I think there is a difference between intentional things and unintentional things. In the world of bias, some people in academia call it implicit bias. Um, things that are um, accidental, you didn't know about it. And then once you know about it, your implicit bias, you have a choice. Will you fix it in yourself or will you claim it as a bias you want to keep? So intent is different than impact, but with intent or no intent, harm is real yeah and there's a difference between hurt and harm hurt you can yeah. repair yeah harm you often can't repair so also I, I think that like personally i don't get to set the rules when it comes to race and how we handle that or what is racism and what is not racism i have some ideas about transphobia i have some ideas about um faithful stuff. I have some ideas about crypt theology, but not all the ideas. But I think that's where you, and I think I agree with you, posit that's the collective body to discern. And I don't think we're having those conversations publicly right now to discern it. I don't think we're, yeah. Yeah, so there are a lot of cultures. I have traveled the world. I have been to a lot of places for two or three days, right? I have listened to a lot of people of different experiences, but the only, all I have is things I've heard from a few people in different communities. I have done a lot of work that involves sitting with people who are living in poverty, but I've done it from the perspective of being able to see the place where I live from where I sat. And 
I think saying that I am a person who is racist is, well, first of all, there's the Lutheran perspective. Lutherans believe we don't have to individually confess for things because God worked it all out for me and I can't screw it up because I can't go back in time and take somebody off a cross and screw up what God's gift for me was. That means Lutherans confess communal sins. So when we're in church together, we confess the things we screwed up as a collective group. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about that being things like, I, I, can, I confess for the ways that American politics is racist. I confess for the ways that I participate in capitalism. I confess for the ways that I'm a part of global warming. I confess for the ways that my actions have, like that's not just what I've done, but what I've left undone. I confess as a white person for being a part of white supremacy. I confess to being a part of a church that historically has marginalized and created the grounds for the Holocaust, right? So I confess to things that are communal sins. So when I say I am racist, I mean, I am bound in, chosen to be a part of communities that are racist. And each day I make decisions that live out policies and principles that are connected to white supremacy woefully entangled in it, don't know how to disconnect myself. I own property in San Francisco that I rent to other people. I'm a part of the housing crisis, right? There are ways that I'm a part of these complicit things. There are times when I have said words I regret because I learned the histories later. There are times when I have assumed someone worked in a place they were not working based on a quick glimpse of them that if I had thought or not acted out of a racial instinct, I would not have made that assumption about people. And I'm sure that I've done it more times than I am aware of. And so it's my obligation to be someone who's working to not only do that less often, but to repair a world where that is palpable. I am the adoptive parent of two black kids who were removed from their families in part because of poverty related epidemics right addiction and so i am a i i don't get credit for being the parent of diverse kids because my being the parent of those diverse kids is a part of the white supremacy culture right and so I am a human being trying to do the best I can in this world, trying to name as often as I can the times when I'm tangled up in crap I'd like to fix. I have been someone who works from the inside to try to change institutions more often than I've worked from the outside. I'm more of a like, I wanna fix that policy in a nerdy way than I wanna shout with a bullhorn. But as you have heard, I end up doing that too, right? Work, if you are someone who chooses to work inside of a system, like I worked for the San Francisco Police Department for three years, there's no way I can't say I'm not a part of a racist, I chose to work in an institution that many people have said has harmed them and is a racialized institution. Working inside of a system means you have to take on some of the blame, even if you think it's for the longer timeline of good. Doesn't get me off the hook though for the ways you have to participate in order to be a part of that change. And whether or not it's okay that I do that or the best way to do it, I don't know. Maybe I'll have a conversation with somebody at a pearly gate later and I'll learn some stuff, right? But me being a person trying to do the best I can with the knowledge I have now, I think only works if I'm willing to name Anytime I notice it, how much I have screwed up and apologize for it at the time, because I'm probably going to screw up tomorrow, right? So I try to live as someone who names what I screwed up when I can, but not so quickly that no one believes I learned anything. Um, but there are ways you can keep learning and still name that harm is real. Yeah, and I would say just to piggyback off this, I think it's always important for us to name how we are complicit in systems because the road to hell is paved with good intentions we can be 
as well-meaning as we want to be and also still perpetuate a racist ideology in the workplace if we're out to dinner with friends you know and i so i think naming our complicitness is um i think an important step in this process of becoming recovering racists so showing off in a title. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to figure out what decolonial gather that is basically Jesus intersects because there was no sperm at that conception. Mm -hmm. If you imagine the body of Christ as praying, what would that mean? How would that mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to your first question around decolonial turn, this, this is something that has been around for a long time. Um, and it's been slow to impact the field of theology and ethics. Um, so a lot of the decolonial stuff comes from like Chicana feminism, which sort of originated here in California. Um, the Global South in liberationist philosophy like Enrique, um, um, Dussel, um, and then there are other sort of decolonial people as well. But, you know, there's something very interesting in the field of theology and ethics. It is almost untouchable to some of these things. Why was it so profound and prophetic that Jim Cohn said God is Black? It's because we have in inherited an image that God is white. Why? Because, Sorry, right, right. So, right, because this history has been erased, right? Um, why, why is empire religion the thing that is fueling our political programs? Because long ago, when Constantine decided to wed together religion and politics, it now has, we discontinued to inherit that, right? And so um, years ago, when I was in seminary, my teacher, Dr. Nancy Bedford, um, said, it's your job to be faithful in the small things. And so what I have tried to do is hold the entirety of the tradition as for me, a trans queer Latinx who is aut autistic. That tradition belongs to me. A lot of people are going to say, no, that tradition doesn't belong to you. And so what I try to do is, you know, turn guns into plowshares, turn the divisive parts of the tradition or the theologies or the ethics that, that um, denigrate my humanity 
and flip it on its head and transform it. Right? I mean, the master's tools are good only insofar as we can transform them. I mean, we are all in the same house and every floor is burning. So it's already on fire. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to play this chess game and claim for ourselves we are the bishop? That was a play. Um, does that make sense? Like, because they don't want to believe that you're the bishop, but if you claim that for yourself, the game of chess, you've already won that game. So, I don't know what would you Until say? you learn you can only move diagonally. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would just add, because, you know, you get to speak to the decolonialism. I'll speak to Christ being trans. Of course, Christ is trans. I just told you to look up the vagina photos. Um, Jesus picks the disciples not because Jesus is psychic, but because Jesus picked the people in the boat who were sewing during a time you weren't allowed to sew. Only the women were allowed to sew. You were supposed to go back to the shore and, and pay them to fix your nets. Jesus picks the ones who can sew because it's not in the Bible, but it's somewhere between the period of the last sentence and the space between before the next sentence, that if God creates Adam by putting Adam to sleep and cutting something out that happens to be female, separating the two and then saying this one's male and this one's female, somewhere in that space between the two sentences, God had to sew Adam back up and God sews, right? And Jesus says, go to the, the last supper at the house of the man who carries water when only women were allowed to wear, carry water, right? And Christ is someone who is surrounded by Moses and Elijah up on a mountain where everything turns white. Cause what was it before? That's right, black. Turns white, Moses, the person who, when he goes to the top of the mountain, talks to God with such a bright light coming out that everyone is sick and tired of seeing the glow from Moses's face. They make Moses wear a veil. Only difference between what men were wearing and women were wearing in that part of the Middle East was the veil. Moses, cross-dressed. Elijah, anytime it says in the Bible that someone girded their loins, it sounds like some sort of, for me, it sounds like what people do in the BART when they have to adjust and then sit. It meant that they took, they all wore dresses. They tucked their dress into their belt and they made it into pants so they could run. That was cross-dressing. You weren't allowed to do it. So they girded their loins, tucked in their dress. Elijah, when he hears the voice of God coming from a cave, girds his loins, cross dresses, covers his face like with a veil to listen to the words of God telling him how to be prophetic in the world. So Jesus goes to the top of a mountain, has a transfiguration moment, all of a sudden becomes glowing and white, hangs out with the dudes who covered their faces with veils. Doesn't say if Jesus wore a veil on his way back down the mountain, the only veil he wears in any sort of Christian art after that, that we didn't burn, sorry, is the veil of the funeral shroud. Because effeminate things equal death. Anybody had that message enforced on them? But if Jesus was someone who wore a veil when he came down that mountain, it would explain while he was hanging out with the women at the well where men weren't supposed to go and the people who wore veils could hang out and have water. It would explain why he was able to socialize with people on the, on the liminal spaces of the gender edges, the sex workers and tax collectors and those that he hung out with. Jesus, unlike what you might read at a football stadium sign says more than any other category. You wanna know the people Jesus says there's a whole list people will tell you you can't go to heaven. There's one group of people Jesus says over and over and over and over is going to heaven first. The sex workers. The sex workers will go to heaven ahead of you. And then they argue, but who of us is the best? The sex workers will go to heaven before you. But who of us is the best? The sex workers are going to go to heaven before you. Right? Because if you take whatever class of society, whatever income of society, whatever gender variant place in society, and you deem them the worst or the hardest or the ones you can't tell your mom about, and God in bones and flesh and body says they're going to heaven, then why can't you with your bones and your flesh and your body? 
you don't get to go first because the sex workers get to go first. But why not you? And if not you, reimagine. Oh, the other thing I want to tell y'all is we could talk all day, and I think you might have noticed that. But if you would like to continue this conversation, tomorrow night we'll be at St. Francis Lutheran, which is at Church and Market, otherwise known as Our Lady of Safeway, the brick church across the street from the Safeway at Church and Market. Six o'clock is the actual time. Okay. Sorry. Okay. It's yeah. Six. Six o'clock. Anyone can come and be a part of the conversation. We'll be talking much like we're talking now in sort of an open and free way. Mm -hmm. Um, and you are welcome and invited to be able to attend, or if you like this, tell other people to come. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah, you're the best. Sorry, we're late. Don't say that. I'm from the Midwest. I have to say that. <laughs> so everyone, again, the beauty of an intimate space is I can just talk from here. Thank you both so much. Um, I have so many notes. Um, mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Happy um, birthday. Uh, they are available for sale. I know two of the ones in the April bundle. If you see them, they're also awesome. Yeah. Um, the because we're for pre college students, the books are $20 each. Um, if you take them for that, and just on behalf of Manny and our One of the things that's so awesome about working in this space is that we can create space for these conversations. So when uh, Dr. Megan he reached out, it was like, hell yeah. And I hope you all understand why that was really just the nail, like the clothing. Like, nice. whoa. Man. You love some stuff. Right, I did. I saw right. the Volvo. Whoa. I know. Okay. I like that you went low. <laughs> So one of the reasons we're able to um, provide the space and have these conversations is because we do the Divine Network and Community of Sponsors who provide monthly contributions to support our work. Um, as you can imagine, they got us through COVID and they continue to be fantastic in this space. Um, we'll be following up with everyone with a quick thank you, but if you are interested in becoming a sponsor, we're definitely going to have Reverend Dr. Megan back. It's yeah. always so much fun. Thank you. 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 Thank you.